Righto team, the time has come to hand back the Moto Marini X-Cape. We've had her for about nine months, which is about six months longer than we initially intended to. Uh, but it's been a great time having this bike on long-term test. Very first one for the channel. Hopefully there's more to come. Uh, but for now, let's cover off what it's been like to have the Moto Marini X-Cape in the garage for the last nine months. Uh, and over 3,000 kilometres of pretty happy riding. So... Without further ado, let's dive in. Rightio, so the Moto Marini X-Cape, uh, it's been one of those bikes I was really excited for initially, and it was one that I thought would do really well in the New Zealand market. Uh, with the Lunar Approved category being one of the most probably hard fought in the entire market, I thought this bike probably had some of the best credentials to really take adventure bike riders uh, into an adventure touring bike that offered a lot for your money, uh, particularly going up directly against the likes of the Suzuki V-Strom, uh, to a lesser extent the Honda CB500X, the Kawasaki Versys 650 and KLR, and the Benelli, what is it, TRK502X. So there's a few bikes in this class, but out of them all, the Moto Marini does come with a very impressive spec. So you've got adjustable Marzocchi suspension. All up the bike weighs about 230 kilos. It is a bit on the heavy side, but on the road that translates to a very planted ride. Uh, you've got a TFT dash with phone connectivity, uh, switchable ABS, which the V-Strom and KLR do not have. It looks really stylish. You've got an adjustable windscreen, backlit switch gear. There's really a lot to like about this bike. So I've had it for about 3,700 kilometers uh, of pretty happy riding. Only a couple of minor niggles in the time I've had this bike. Uh, primarily, um, well, the main one, this windscreen adjuster up here, uh, the Allen bolt that holds that in place can work loose and you get a bit of an annoying buzz uh, as the wind hits the windshield. Uh, the other wee niggle is uh, these beautiful plastics. They're not dirt bike plastics, guys. So if you're going to take this bike off-road, you really want to make sure that uh, you buy some crash protection for it because uh, I can tell from experience, unfortunately, that if this bike falls over, uh, the plastics don't come away looking just as good as they did when they went in. Um, so that's something I'm going to have to own. Uh, sorry again, Motor Marini New Zealand. Um, I will offer to pay for the damage uh, when this bike fell over in the sand. Uh, other than that though, it has been quite a pleasant bike to ride. So, so I put out on social media, uh, on the On Throttle Instagram and Facebook accounts, uh, asking for some, well, what you guys wanted to know. So I'll go through the questions I got and do my best to answer them. So quality and reliability, that is the main one that came from Brendo. Uh, quality and reliability. Pretty good, I've got to say. Uh, obviously, it is built to a price, so it isn't going to be up there with the likes of the manufacturers from Europe. Uh, this bike is still made in China, but I think it is holding up really nicely. There's no rust forming anywhere on it. Uh, everything is still holding in place. I've had nothing fall off the bike. It's held together pretty well. Like I say, the plastics are the one thing you got to watch out for uh, because... As much as this is an adventure touring bike, it more leans towards the road side of things. It's not going to like it if you drop it. Reliability wise, I've had absolutely no issues with this bike. None whatsoever. It's been great. So it's always started up, even when I haven't ridden it for a month or so, uh, which unfortunately has happened because life gets in the way. Um, it's always started up, never had an issue with it, uh, and it's been quite an enjoyable bike to have in the shed. So another question, how does it compare to the T7? So, yes, the T7. Honestly, kind of different kettles of fish there. Uh, the T7 is definitely more dirt focused. Um, you've got the 21 inch front wheel versus a 19 on this. Uh, but in terms of gravel riding, which uh, Tal particularly asked for, um, honestly, I kind of lean towards this more than the T7. The T7 is a bit more flighty, it's a bit taller, it feels a little bit less connected to the ground. Uh, where this, partly because of its weight I think, uh, it feels really solid when you're out on gravel uh, or on the road. It's quite a nice bike to just go out and explore the easy stuff. 
Uh, if I was going to do the 42 Traverse, I know I'd definitely prefer to be on a T7 rather than this, but for gravel roads, uh, yeah, this is my pick. Easier to get down your foot down to the ground, and honestly, it's quite a nice place to find yourself. Okay, so cost of the typical service, that does depend on the dealership. Unfortunately, that is one place where the New Zealand market does kind of fall down a bit flat. There isn't a huge dealer network and the importer has been struggling to get dealers to come on board, which is a real shame because these bikes do have a lot to offer. Uh, on the TFT dash, it does give you a countdown as to when your next service is due. That is after the first thousand kilometers, you go in for your break-in service, and then it's every 6,000 kilometers after that for an oil change with everything else sort of mixed in there. So I think it's every 12,000 kilometers for the air filter, which unfortunately requires you to remove all the plastics from the seat forward to get access to. So that's a bit of a hassle, particularly if you're going to be riding in a lot of dust. Other than that though, servicing it is pretty simple stuff. Uh, oil drain bolt underneath, pop it out, done. Any benefits to an aftermarket can to improve response or sound? Honestly, sound wise, I think this bike sounds all right. It is a 180 degree crank, just like the Versi 650. It doesn't have that sort of 270 degree burble that the T7 and other parallel twins typically have nowadays. But I think it almost sets it apart because it doesn't sound like every other parallel twin out there. Um, an exhaust, uh, if you get a slip on can, you are replacing only a small section of the pipe. So from there to there. Unless you change the cat, you're not really going to see a lot of difference in performance. Uh, you're mostly going to get just the sound. Personally, I like the styling and how tucked in the factory exhaust is. So that is my preference. I'd keep it stock. Uh, also means you can cruise around at night and not bother everyone. Speaking of at night, uh, also been asked how the headlights are. Uh, so this has got LED lighting all around and honestly I don't think there's anything to really complain about there. As always, you could always do with more light on a motorcycle. Um, and you do see guys around with big spotties connected to the uh, crash protection. Uh, if I own this bike, I'd probably go that way as well, just for the extra peace of mind. But from the night riding I've done, which I'll admit is pretty limited and has, I've not really done like back roads out in the middle of nowhere, uh, it's been fine. It's definitely a lot better than, say, a DR650 <laughs> candle. So, yeah, it's pretty good the lighting. Speaking of, I should probably turn the lighting off uh, so I don't drain the battery flat. Uh, OEM or aftermarket parts availability. So that's a interesting one. OEM, there's a handful of parts you can get through the distributor including crash bars, a skid plate and luggage. Uh, you can get a full set of hard cases for this bike for about 1500 bucks including the uh, racks there. Um, OEM, well aftermarket, sorry, uh, well that's still something that's sort of building up. I have seen a really cool skid plate being built in Italy for this bike which addresses some of the issues with the factory one which is a bit limiting. It doesn't really give you that much protection, it just sort of adds a little bit there. But this cool one I've seen overseas, I'll see if I can add it in uh, to the video here. Basically it protects from about there all the way down and under. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's some stuff out there, but it's not like a really popular Japanese bike or a properly uh, popular Euro bike. Uh, there are some gaps there and it is a pretty small manufacturer at the end of the day. Uh, any must-haves you would fit? Uh, must-haves for me would be uh, some form of crash protection. Like I've said, the plastics don't appreciate hitting the ground. Um, and the other one, which currently is not fitted, is the aftermarket uh, Moto Marini Touring windscreen. That makes a huge difference. This screen is pretty narrow, uh, so you do get a bit of wind blast on your shoulders. The Touring screen is a lot wider, and it gives you a bit more of a bubble to hide behind. buttock comfort rating on longer rides. Honestly, I'd rate this bike. It is a pretty comfy seat, especially coming off the CRF 250 Rally. Um, I did a big tour of Taranaki with uh, Ray from Moto NZ with this bike. And honestly, at the end of the day, I was still ready to keep riding. Uh, one area that I think it could be slightly more comfortable for me is, uh, especially with the inserts and the pegs down here, is you, uh, I find, 
I need to stretch my legs a little bit. But in terms of butt comfort, um, it's been fine. I wouldn't call it all day comfy, uh, but it's definitely right up there and more than up for the task of touring the country on. Suspension. Is it mushy when loaded up or is the preload adequate? So I've not particularly loaded this up heavy. Um, I have taken an overnight bag and bits and bobs for our Taranaki mission. I didn't really notice any difference in the suspension. You can adjust it, of course. You've got preload adjustment and compression at the rear, as well as full adjustability on the forks up front if you do want to do that. Uh, though i got to say, accessing the adjuster for the rear is not as easy as it probably could be. Um, but you set that up before your big ride if you're putting down a heap of luggage or carrying your pillion anyway. Um, and you'd set it and forget it. Okay, so what niggles do I have with it? So, I've had this bike for nine months or so. I forget how long I've had it exactly, but coming up on 4,000 Ks, and I've only got two sort of niggles to complain about, really. So the first is the one I've already mentioned. It's the windscreen adjuster bolt, which, in actuality, I've not really had an issue with since I've noted it as an issue, and... Every now and then I've just nipped it up when I've been doing a clean of the bike. The other one comes to the phone connectivity. So when I had my phone and Cardo paired to the bike and I was listening to podcasts, every now and then it would start doing a bit of a dropout thing where it would sort of click and I'd miss a word or two in the podcast I was listening to, which that got a bit annoying and to the point where I stopped using the phone connectivity feature of the bike. Um, do I miss it? No. Is it a big deal? I don't think so, but if you really like your tech and you like to have your music or podcast or whatever you're listening to displaying on your bike's dash in front of you, uh, that might be something to keep an eye on. I don't know if there's a software update available. Um, I know in other markets they now have the navigation feature enabled, which for me that would definitely be worth uh, connecting your phone up for and putting up with stuff. Um, but yeah, I haven't spoken to the distributor about that little niggle either. So that's just something I experienced. Taking the Cardo and just pairing it directly to the phone uh, resolved that issue. And for, to be honest, most of the time when I've been riding this bike, I have had my phone sitting right up here on the handlebar with a quad lock on a uh, wireless charger. So I haven't really needed the phone connectivity anyway. So uh, yeah, there's that. So I've filled this bike up with gas 14 times. 14 full tanks of gas have gone through this bike and uh, I've worked out the economy ratings. So this is all in litres per 100 kilometres. Uh, so my worst economy was the very first fuel up. That was 5.3 litres per 100 kilometres. Uh, my best was 4.15 litres per 100 kilometres and that works out to an average of 4.65 litres per 100 k. So easily get 300 k's out of a tank of this thing. A uh, wee bit more if you are going gently and not honing it. Um, decent sized tank, it's 18 litres and yeah, it's a good touring, touring capacity. Right, so the big question, would I happily keep this if they offered it to me? Honestly, I'd be pretty tempted. The big things holding me back are of course the dealer network, which I hope that changes in the future because Motor Marini has some really cool bikes coming out. So this Sayamezzo uh, SCR and STR, they're all based off that Versys uh, 650 platform or that Kawasaki 650 platform. Uh, the new bikes coming out, the 750s and 1200s, they're all built on Moto Marini's own platform. They've got big V twin engines, they have some very cool styling and I hope the brand cements itself so that we actually get to see those here in New Zealand because they look really cool. Uh, they've got some tremendous styling going on there and I think they're some of the best looking bikes coming out in 2024-2025. Rightio, so that is my final verdict on the Moto Marini X-Cape. It is going back to the distributor very soon. Uh, overall, I think it's a cracking bike. It's only let down by a small dealer network here in New Zealand. Uh, all the little minor niggles uh, to take it more heavier adventure touring, uh, very easily fixed in the aftermarket I think. Uh, slap on some more aggressive tyres and you're away. Or slap on some road tyres and just enjoy this as a nice touring motorcycle. It's very capable of doing just that. Uh, so she's going back to Auckland, I'm going to be without a motorcycle for a wee while, so we'll see what the future holds in terms of what I'll be riding next. 
Uh, but till next time, thanks heaps for watching, eh? Ciao.